Welcome to Speed Bumps Live, everybody. Yeah, it is uh, the day before Halloween, so, you know, we got to do this, right? Listen, for everybody who's joining us for the first time, welcome uh, to this special episode of Speed Bumps Live, where we normally talk about marketing challenges and opportunities with leaders from different industries. This week, like I said, we're doing something a little different, a whole lot of fun, and we have zero idea of how this is gonna go, but that's actually the scary and fun part of marketing. My name is Disheveled Uncle Sam, because 2020, am I right? And I'm Javier Shantana. Welcome to Speed Bumps, everybody. Hey, hey, hey. Actually, I'm supposed to be Javier. For I love it. I love it. It looks great. I'm I do my you know, best. We're, we're gonna we're gonna we're gonna stay in character as much as we can because again, so. why yeah. not? Twenty twenty. Yeah, man, it's got, Friday. You know, we got to right. do this. That's right. It's very pretty rare. A uh, you know, we have Halloween on a on a Saturday for everybody, and then it's a Saturday in which you know, right before an election and everything like that. But uh, you know, we're gonna have fun with this. So. Listen, before we get started, and, and I know it's going to be hard to take us serious, but we do have some pretty serious and scary stories to tell. Um, but before we get started, I do want to let you know the chat feature is off. Um, we want you to focus on all of this great content. Um, and we do have the Q&A module open. Don't know if we're going to have time to get to them, but go ahead and start populating some questions in there or submit some more scary stories and uh, we'll see what we can do. But hang in there, hold on to your seat because we're about to go for a little bumpy ride on speed bumps. So hope you enjoy it. Hey, Shannon, yeah. Javier, what's the first scary marketing story we've got to tell? All right, so my first scary marketing story is actually from a time when I was at Kids 2 here in Atlanta. <laughs> and uh, I'd just gotten in you know, the job, there was a bunch of technology laying around that hadn't been, been implemented. And one of those things was Bizarre Voice for ratings and reviews. So I got this big idea that we were gonna put in the ratings and review program and get all these product reviews and syndicate it out to Walmart and Target and Toys R Us and Babies R Us and all those guys. And so in the span of about 18 months, we went from zero to 3,000 reviews. We did a really cool seating program that was like a friends and family thing where we gave away free product for people to give us reviews. It was really great, very successful. Uh, so successful that I pissed off all the product managers in the company. All of them hated me. And the reason was because they started having bad product ratings for some of their products for the first time ever. Um, and there were a handful of products that were getting really bad reviews. So then it became like a fight. Everybody wanted me to take that review down, take these review down, we can't have any bad reviews. And I'm trying to tell everybody, listen, this is real, it's authentic. You can't take down bad reviews. People will know, it'll get out on social. It's a really bad idea. And so as the kind of battle continued to rage and I was pushing back on you know, even leadership to keep this program up and running and keep the reviews flowing, I decided to dig into the data a little bit. So I took all those 3,000 reviews. I took a big social listening project where we kind of looked across the web to see what people were saying about stuff. And then I worked with our customer service team to see what kind of calls were coming into the call center. And then we also had our own social channels where we were seeing stuff, right? So we took all that data and gosh, I think we probably churned on it for a couple, you know, two, three months to kind of get something out of it. But when it came back, what was really interesting was it wasn't the products that were bad. It was right. actually the installation and, and instruction setup process it was assembly. That was the problem. And you think about it for a minute. You have like, you know, pregnant ladies trying to build things for babies that they need in order to keep their baby safe. And then they can't figure out how to do it because the instruction manual is written in a bunch of jargon and junk that people don't understand. And so there's a lot of emotion. We even brought people into a lab and watch them like, you know, give a pregnant lady a screwdriver and tell her to put something together. And, you know, 15 minutes later, there's crying. So as we dug into it, we realized what we needed to do was to redesign these manuals, turn them into something really cool that had a brand story that was broken up in a really visual way, didn't use that jargon language, 
then the other thing we did, and this was like in 2015, um, is we wound up creating uh, assembly videos for all of those major products. So we actually put all those videos up on YouTube. The customer service team had links that they could send people when they called in and they were having problems. The social team had links that they could post, um, you know, to give to people when there were complaints. So, you know, I would say the horror part of that story is I had about a good, you know, like four, five, six month battle with people. And like, I was pretty new to the company. So I was making a lot of enemies for something that I really wasn't even doing, right? Other than just yeah. enabling consumers. So, you know, it could have gone really badly, but I think by mining into the data and bringing it forth and using it to empower product managers to realize it wasn't the product design, but it was really more this other part of it. Um, we actually turned around and almost all of those, there was like 15 products, um, all of them in the span of about a six month time period after we did that project had an average of a one and a half star rating higher oh, wow. than yeah. where we started. So it, it worked. So there was my nice, nice. story. Well, I think the, the, yeah, the really cool part there is uh, you're talking about 2015, five years ago, and you were already thinking about how to take written instructions and start putting those into video format and, and kind of the, the, the real dumb marketing term of snackable content, but mm -hmm. something that would give people um, those quick little kind of validations visually. There's two types of people, people that love to read and people that love to watch. And so I think you covered both of those. And I think that's, that's something we obviously see today five years later, but um, you know, I think you doing it uh, back in 2015 was pretty massive. So kudos to you <laughs> always. Yeah. Awesome, man. That's a, that's a great story. I love it. I love it. I love it. So um, real quick, the format, what we're going to do is we're going to try to have people come on and tell their story. Um, and then in between those, we're going to read some stories that were submitted. So we're going to have our first story um, that I'm going to read, and I hope I do this person justice. So this one's a, a pretty good one, too. So the uh, title of this story, or this uh, spooky tale, is Revenge is a Dish Best Served Stinky. So this one is an anonymous story. And here, here I'll, I'll, try to do, I'll try to do my best impression here. In a previous fundraising role, I used, Jeremy, you're going to like this one. In a previous fundraising role, I used to frequent a local chamber of commerce's blog to keep up with the community happenings. One day I visited the blog and all of the content was gone. And I saw the word poop in all caps on the screen in giant letters. I immediately called my contact at the chamber to tell her about the problem, trying to keep from laughing the whole time. And apparently it was the revenge of a fired employee. I think we've all had some of those. Um, since the firing happened weeks ago, there's no telling how many people had also been treated to this little nugget while trying to access the blog. So. That's a, pretty, that's a pretty terrifying story uh, for that chamber. Um, the resolution for this is um, this person got an email a few minutes after uh, seeing it and saying the poop has been scooped. Um, while the poopy page was an easy enough problem for my colleague to correct, I'm sure she always remembered to change the password moving forward, especially if a vengeful ex-staff member was on the loose. So I think that's, uh, that's something we could all relate to and, and definitely uh, make sure your passwords are very much protected. Got anything to share there, Javier Shantana? I just, I think we've all seen something like that. I remember one time I was working on a project and somebody had hidden the Easter egg into a baby name generator. And I forget the name it was when you searched, but when you searched it, a picture of a chupacabra came up. <laughs> pretty good one, right? Oh, that, That's a pretty that good, good Easter egg That's, legacy. So I, love it. I think I we've love all it. seen those, but that, that one's public facing. That, that's pretty bad. 
That's pretty yeah, bad. Yeah, yeah, that's not good. Well, to help lighten the load, um, let us bring on our first special guest. It's somebody you've all become familiar with, uh, Miss Jennifer Erdman. Jen, welcome to the show again. Thank you. I got my, uh, my glowing kitty cat ears because I have to go to a parent teacher meeting at fall festival and they judge the mothers. So I'm not going <laughs> to sign up for that today. Yes. Yes. <laughs> So what do you got for us, Jen? I know you've got a million great stories. Is not nearly as entertaining or as smart Shannon is yours, or should I say Javier Shantana? Um, <laughs> mine goes back to my days when I was a young, a young buck working on American Idol when I was with um, AT&T. And we, as part of a media buy, and that's when Idol was like Idol, like 21 million view viewers a night and everyone tuning in. And it was my first season on Idol. And we were just now the exclusive voting partner and we had all of these rights. And that's when like text messaging was like on fire. And it was our night to do the live integration of like, show them what they've won. Like you pull the little phone up and you're like, and Ryan's gonna talk about all the cool things that AT&T does. And we're about to do a demo on live television. 90 seconds going into commercial. We have about 90 seconds. So we come back, the network went down. <laughs> I wanted to go into a hole and cry, <laughs> um, realize that could I update my resume in the next 90 seconds? <laughs> Could I somehow wipe out the producer, knock out the cameraman and make, blame it not on me? And I literally was scrambling. I'm like, oh my God. And my agency at the time who was with me and I'm like, you know, I'm in my early age in my career and I'm like, just got promoted. I'm going to make take the world by storm. Network goes down. Um, my agency at the time, he's Russian. He's like, friend, this is not good. I'm like, thank you, Captain <laughs> Obvious. <laughs> Little understatement. <laughs> thank you. And I literally, at that moment, because I worked in telco for so long and wireless, I grabbed my phone. And that's when you could program them without over-the-air activation. You could manually still program. I went back in. I manipulated the back end. I jumped on another carrier's network. I won't say who. And they're coming back from commercial in 15, 14. And we did the entire demo on air on another carrier's network <laughs> because wow. I managed to last minute remember, put my wits back it with me and managed to ride the coattails of another network to be able to get the demo done. They yelled cut, everything was done. Um, I promptly went to the green room and threw up <laughs> and cried a little. And then Ryan Seacrest came back. He's like, that went well. I'm like, buddy, you have no idea the miracle I just pulled off, right? <laughs> and it's like those, those scenes in the movies, like you're running at the last minute. But the lesson that I learned was one, prepare, 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 but also have B and C lined up the plans. And what had happened, there was an absolute miscommunication with LA that they were doing a test at that moment and th that they restricted limitations inside the theater and it wasn't it wasn't intentional so better communication and then I had a cow there next time which is cellular on wheels to ensure that there was not going to be a latency or an issue um, but I literally was like my moment in the sun you're all and I'm like I can't disappoint Paula Simon will yell at me like, I mean, <laughs> I need to be prepared, but it was a very eye opener because everyone's like, you're so lucky entertainment's so much fun. And it is, but when you are working at it clinically, it is, you constantly don't know. And every time now I see an integration, I'm almost like, oh, that cost them 4 million. Oh, that wasn't supposed to do that. Or this, it's very clinical, but it was my moment of preparedness and failure to prepare. And my Russian friend, speaking the obvious. I'm like, thanks for your help. You're fired too. <laughs> hey, everybody. I'm gonna go. <laughs> and then I cried myself to sleep with a bottle of um, vodka, like every good marketing person does after a big event. I'm just kidding. Uh, duh. <laughs> or, or just, you know, <laughs> I just in a hole for a while. <laughs> and but ended up looking like, like this. Was, yeah, that was the scariest moment for me of like, I thought I was prepared. I did everything that I thought would work in our demo and everything. You just don't, I didn't think three steps beyond that of what mm -hmm. if, 
the what if was very obvious and we got through it, but it never, trust me, never happened again. So that yeah. was, that's my moment of entertainment hell at the moment. <laughs> that is really terrifying. I mean, yes. to just to think about, and we've all done something like that in a different situation where, you know, you're going into that client meeting or you're about to hit the, you know, button on a launch in a website or whatever, but something that's so massive to be on camera and the whole nation's watching and you feel like it's all on you. I, I can't even imagine. You just brought back the pit in my stomach when you said on oh, camera and the whole world's watching. Sorry. <laughs> <I was> like, <laughs> yes, yeah. yes, and yes, yes, yes. Wow. But Red redundancy, yeah. Redundancy can be our friend in many, many, many ways. For sure. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Well, that Jen, was my lesson learned. Jen, thank you so much for sharing one. that. Obviously, stick around, uh, stay on camera as much as you want. Uh, love to have some anecdotes as we read off some other scary stories. So scary. And then what do we have next? So scary. <laughs> um, so we've got a really great story from Alan McGee, who was from over at Church's Chicken, who was going to be here with us. Um, but I'm going to do my best to kind of read his story on his behalf. So. We like to call this story the soundtrack to my first fail. Setting the scene here, uh, it was my first job at an agency after my first promotion to a new team, working on my first TV spot. So you can see Alan's got a lot of firsts going on here. It was an edit of a very successful campaign with an updated offer only. So just make that small update. When we edited the spot, we actually edited a past version that wasn't the final and it had a different music track that was the holding track. It was actually Camp Town Races. I can't imagine that was what they wanted. Um, he's, the creative team flipped out when they saw it on air with Camp Town Races playing in the background. And we had to revise and edit in that first week to get it back up there. Um, so it was quickly resolved. And it, but they had to go and explain the mistake to the client and how it would never happen again. And Alan said the lesson that he learned early in his career was that a leader steps up and steps up for the team and takes the heat rather than passing it down to somebody. It would have been really easy to say, well, the creative team didn't do something or, you know, the editor did something wrong. Um, but he stepped in and he took that responsibility and took that heat. And, you know, and according to Alan, the Relationship with the client went very well from there. They knew it was a mistake, you know, it was easily corrected. Um, but I would imagine that was a pretty horrifying thing to find out that, you know, Camp Town Races was playing instead of whatever the music was that was supposed to be playing. So I think we probably all have a version of that story in Absolutely. a different way, right? Absolutely. Yeah, yeah. that was a yeah. good one. That, that is a good one. Yeah. You know, what I think is interesting, I'm gonna add, yeah. is that, people who are from the outside and they see a campaign executed or something it from the lens it should look flawless right it should be like a ballet it looks beautiful and flawless there's so many fail points that it's a miracle that we they all don't fall apart more right <laughs> when you have to rely on so many people and so many efforts and so many things and the devil's in the details and it's it's interesting to see like how much gets pulled off and then and then it's course correcting. It's, it's that, I think, critical thinking and then responsiveness that is imperative in what we do. And, and it sometimes um, brush like poo poo, like, oh, that's not really a big deal. But being able to have those contingencies, how to fix it, and being able to gracefully fix something, I think is something we all learn when we're younger, when we don't gracefully do it. And we learn how to do it better as we get older. Yeah, no, that's well said. Well said. Um, I, we're going to move on to our next guest that wants to come on. Uh, Nicole, are you with us? I am. Excellent. Hi. Thanks for joining us, Nicole. Yeah, Nicole, thank real you. Quick. Yeah, absolutely. Real quick, for, for anybody that doesn't know, Nicole is VP of Marketing at Tackle.io. She's also chapter head of the Revenue Collective, in which... We're going to have to talk more about that, being Uncle Sam and revenue. Hey, hey. Um, so, uh, no, in all seriousness, thank you for coming to the show. Can you, uh, can you tell us about one of your scary stories? Sure. I have a, I feel like I have a lot. Um, <laughs> there, there's no shortage. And 
I had sent some over and ideas and then I was talking to someone yesterday and I was like, oh, you know what? This is actually probably my scariest one. Um, so I'll share one um, because this was like a career move I made. And I think it's a really good lesson, you know, probably for anyone who's, you know, you know, I know there's a lot of people changing jobs and looking at new jobs. So this would be, I think, some great advice is like, because I made a big, scary marketing move and mistake. Um, so I took a CMO role. Um, and, you know, I, th I was really looking to get out of an organization. And I think I was really quick to kind of jump into this new role at a company that it seemed like this was a great leveling up move and opportunity to take on this more global role. And when I got there, I realized, you know, they wanted someone that was a marketing, probably coordinator or manager, really, not a CMO. Um, and they didn't have, they really didn't have a marketing system or foundation in place. But, you know, I was brought on with the assumption that I was going to be building like this marketing foundation, helping with marketing and sales alignment, building an inbound flow, which is stuff I love to do. And once I came in, I started building the plan of like, you know, here's how I'm going to do this. I'm going to align with all these other different departments. Here's how we need to get, you know, the Marketo set up and here's, everything we need to do to build this content marketing engine and pretty quickly i realized that the ceo was very misaligned on what he thought i was going to be doing um every all the other leadership was as well and they really just wanted a marketer to come in and immediately start generating an absurd amount of leads a month with no um, real system in place they didn't have any of this built they didn't have any content they didn't have an actual like marketing and sales handoff process they didn't even have a marketing automation system set up and running so um you know their solution was just go write white papers write tons of white papers and let's go gate those on the website and that'll help us generate leads um, which is the most probably archaic thing i've heard of you know in <laughs> this day and age of that yeah that's going to really help us generate leads and let's do a lot of social media posts and that should do it for us so you know as i look back on that i would you know that's a fault of my own of i should have interviewed the team a lot better i should have asked them about you know how do you view marketing and sales alignment i should have been asking to talk to the board during those conversations and you know, they didn't have a head of marketing before. So I think, you know, what I advise people and what I've done since then is, you know, talking to if, you know, when I went into my current company now, like, you know, okay, they don't have a head of marketing now, but you know, who is the CEO previously worked with that's a head of marketing and how did they view that head of marketing relationship and how did they work with them? And I think, you know, before you accept a role like that, you should really align on what your objectives are, what your budget will be and how you'll be measured before you jump into that role and understand how that's looked at or else it's really like setting yourself up for failure in that role and you don't really know what you're getting into. So I think that would probably be actually my scariest marketing story because I was there for three months and um, was really trying to make it work and hoping that we could align on this is what a CMO should do. You know, I'm willing to get my hands dirty, but I need to be able to think strategically and this is how I should be working with your CRO and with you, CEO and board. But um, that's not what they wanted out of someone. And that sucks to be somewhere and say, this yeah. isn't going to work and I need to leave and move on. Yeah. That's terrifying. <laughs> what was the final straw for you when you knew it was time to move on? Like you were obviously trying to make it happen, make it work. So what was it that just made you go, not worth it? Uh, I think probably when I would get um, emails from the CEO, I would think we would have a productive conversation. And then I would get emails from the CEO and just, he would say, yeah, I, I understand what we talked about, but you, you know, tell me how quickly you can do three white papers and then probably, you know, three webinars. Um, when, when can we get these done so we can get more leads? Yeah. And that was just the only, he had a one track mind. Yeah. Just tactics, just tactics, tactics, yeah. tactics. Just, yeah. You know, it didn't yeah. matter. There was no foundation building and strategy yeah. at the organization. I was like, it's no matter how many times I try and have this conversation, it's not going to work. Yeah. That's a wow. good one. That's, I think you. we've all made us, yeah. we've all done one of those, right? Like, I think probably everybody on the camera right now, probably on this meeting, it's going to have a story like that, right? <laughs> yeah, absolutely. When you know, you know, you're like, uh oh. <laughs> yep. Gotta go. 
across the country and I uprooted my whole family. We sat down and on day three, I knew I made a mistake of gargantuan proportions. Oh. And I thought, oh my God, I just moved. I thought it's a great point that Nicole mentioned that you, I didn't, I, I wanted it to work and I probably missed mm -hmm. red flags along the way because it was a company that I was just desired to work there. It would be amazing. I got too wrapped around the romanticizing of what could happen. I got there and realized this was a massive mistake and I lasted 10 months that of sheer hell yeah. and had to go tell my husband, I'm like, you know, like we sold everything and we uprooted. I told you this is going to be great. Um, I hate it here. He's like, me too. I'm like, thank God. We out. <laughs> that made it a little easier, didn't it? <laughs> yeah. yeah. It's a long time though. And it's, it's, it's it's a lesson because you grapple honestly you grapple with yourself of like am i just used to it's not change is it you know there's all those things you have to think through and then yeah. you're like it's not right but i knew and my my gut knew three days in I'm like yeah this is it is it's it's one of those things that you i think like you have that gut feeling and you figure it out pretty quickly and i think even towards the final stages of the process, there was something that didn't feel right in my gut, but I was like, no, it's okay. You know, you push through it. But yeah, I think yeah. there's a very strong gut instinct that people know that they should trust and always, always use that. Trust yeah. the gut. Good advice. Yep. Yep. Good, good advice for sure. Awesome. Nicole, thank you. And obviously stick great. around on camera as long as you want. Would love to have some of your, your feedback as, as we're going through some of these other stories. Shannon, we've got another one here with the yeah. uh, Mr. Anonymous. This one's my Mr. favorite. Anonymous. This is this my is favorite. A good one. This is my favorite, I think. Um, we're calling this story pictures or it didn't happen. So this person says, when I worked on the agency side, I worked on EPT, early pregnancy test. The 55-year-old male marketing director for the brand complained that he never saw his TV ads. Well, we said, it's because we're targeting women 22 to 35, right? He still didn't get it why he never saw his ads. So the agency put an EPT ad into the middle of his favorite show, Monday Night Football. And then conversely, put a chic ad for Razors in the middle of a women's soap opera targeting that, that that's a product that targets men 18 to 55 so he kind of flipped the script on them so they could see it um so i thought that was really pretty funny i think we've all been there right like we've all had that moment where the client's like i don't see my ads i never know so the same person said okay then fast forward here i am at the same agency sometime later working on a new flavored soda from pepsi called slice moment of silence for slice it was good. It was good, right? Yeah, yeah, I liked it. All right, so RIP Slice. So the client comes to us in December of, uh, on December 20, rather, I almost said of 20, but that didn't happen yet. I want it to be done. Um, so it comes to us on December 20th with a million bucks and says, I got to spend it by the end of the year. We've all had that happen too, right? Um, so they said the fastest way to spend that million bucks by the end of the year was to do a full page newspaper ad with a coupon in every major newspaper market, starting at number one and going all the way down the list until they just spend it all out, right? So with that much money, they were able to buy the top 30 papers in the US. But the marketing director calls and says, hey, while you're at it, can you also put this print ad in the newspapers in Greenwich, Connecticut, Cherry Hill, New Jersey, and White Plains, New York? I'm gonna ask anybody here, why do you think that was? I know why. They're not even the top 200 in the country. It was because there, that's where that the Pepsi executives live. lived. Yep. So uh, clearly this thing. person learned their lesson uh, with the yep. EPT client and uh, used a little bit of that magic um, later on. And I know that's something that I personally have done myself um, when I'm you know, doing things for clients is trying to make sure that a little bit of that media shows up somewhere that the client is or is likely to be, because I do think that's a very real thing that we deal with as marketing people managing up to an executive team. You know, if, if it's just kind of like pictures or it didn't happen, right? If I don't see my ad in the places that I go, then where are we advertising and why aren't we seeing this stuff? Even if 
we're not the target demo. So I thought that was a really great story and a really great learning. I don't know if either, either of you have had an experience like that before. I do. I have a lot of stuff. You know, we do a lot of paid ads on things like LinkedIn and Google AdWords. Mm -hmm. And, you know, that is what you don't want. Um, your, any of your internal like team clicking on those because it's costing money every time someone clicks. But, you mm -hmm. know, I've run into situations in the past where, you know, your CEO or someone like that is like, I know we're doing paid LinkedIn ads or Google ads, but it's not showing up. You know, we're suppress you can suppress people. So on LinkedIn, you can say, I don't want anyone from my current company to see this and like block those people out. And so, you know, I've released it and let them see it. And then um, you track it and you're like, oh my gosh, they're clicking on all these ads in that situation <laughs> as soon as you let them see it. Double edged sword, right? Yeah, they're the ones now costing us money on these ads. So it's just so painful. It definitely is that. Yeah. Awesome. Okay. Great read, Javier Shantana. Really thank you, well thank done. Thank you. Thank you. You're welcome. There it is. That's what I've been waiting for. Awesome. So let's uh, <laughs> let's segue over to uh, Dean Velez, founder of the Anvil Studios and all around master of motion graphics and macabre. Dean, welcome to the show. Oh, so scary. Oh my goodness. Yes. I put this on and it's so loud in here that I cannot have any idea what the heck is happening out here. I'm turning it over now. God. At least it's not stuck on your head, though. It, oh, my God. No, put it back on. <laughs> <laughs> I kid. No. I kid. <laughs> no, oh. I'm not doing that. It is so hot in there. And I've yeah. been wearing it going, I don't know if I'll be ready. I don't know if I'll be ready. Let me have this <laughs> on and just be ready. I'm going yeah. <laughs> Well, I know you have a million scary stories. So. I have. My whole career has been one scary story after that. We don't have enough time for that? So. No, and, and it's always for two reasons. Uh, no budget and tight deadline. Yeah. Every single time, it's yeah. the same thing. Yeah. So this is a no budget uh, tight deadline story. Awesome. So in 2013, uh, previous studio that I worked with, uh, with Paul, uh, we had just opened up and a producer from Cartoon Network came in just for a tour. We didn't have the computer set up. Uh, we didn't have staff. We were still decorating the space we were renting. And she goes, I love this artwork you have up. This is what I want to do for this promo I have. I'm already awarding you the job. You don't have to bid. It's yours. That never happens. So I'm like, okay. This is great. We don't know what the job is, though. <laughs> no idea. We just were so excited. We got a job. Um, yes, we take the job. So she comes back and gives us the rundown of deliverables. And I basically am just panicking. Because we don't have anybody to help us. And there, this is a year-long campaign for Cartoon Network Latin America. So we have to have something that lasts a year and there's so many components. And then I realized that's not enough money. That's nowhere near enough money to do anything. But, but, but I can't say anything. It's like, if, if we lose this job, we're never gonna get to work with them again. Um, so she walks out, I freak out. And I said, well, we, we can do this in 3D and I said, or we could just do it and not tell her what we're doing. <laughs> Where could that go wrong? <laughs> I'm like, here's, here, here's the thing. This deadline is so tight, it just has to hit air. So we're going to do some risky stuff. We're going to get one done and approved, and then we're going to go whatever freaking way we want because <laughs> we can't do this. So this is the true, 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 true story. We get one really polished one done in 3D. I actually hire a 3D freelancer. Uh, I do the design. It's all good. And then for the next, I went to Toys R Us. I only have one of these. And I just bought crappy toys. <laughs> I basically, all the rest of it, where it was supposed to be 3D, is me 
on a teeny tiny green screen that I just kind of fabbed. I took 10 grand out of the budget to buy a camera and I don't know how to shoot. <laughs> I got Home Depot lighting and we just sat there and this is the spot. Yeah. So you this did a puppet the, show. You yeah, it was, puppet puppet show. Puppet show. it was just a puppet show. It was just a puppet show and we had a little, um, it was around Easter. So there were Easter toys out. So we had a little wind up bunny that walked over the green screen and this little guy chased him and it was nonsensical. It didn't have anything to do with anything. I think we did 16 spots, wow. something outrageous. That's amazing. And the funny thing, this is the, this is, never saw this coming. And then they awarded us <laughs> <laughs> a BDA <laughs> and a New York one. <laughs> Nice. Do you carry those around with you everywhere? Because he just had I, them like ready yeah. to go, didn't Oh, he? no, I had a whole prop thing here. <laughs> <laughs> I had Godzilla ready to go. I didn't know how much time I had. So I was just like, all right, I'll, I'll put these off to the side. That's great. See, hey, listen, that's a, that's a, that's a story about um, uh, having your redundancy, planning. Absolutely. Dean was, Dean was plan he was planning for all of these, uh, all of these uh, uh, Every props. Every discrepancy. So has to be planned for. Yeah, what I, what I really wanna take away from that though, Dean, so we can get um, over to uh, another story yeah. that we have to read. But one thing that I really love about that is a lot of times uh, creativity um, is from people who aren't creative is often just seen as pixels, colors, fonts, things like that. When really creativity is how you problem solve. Yes. And come up with Absolutely. really um, resilient um, and so just solutions, uh, which I, I think you do a, a really tremendous job at. So thank you for sharing that story. That, that was, was that's amazing. <laughs> and I have seen those spots. Those are, <laughs> they are, they are amazing. Uh, they're really cute. Um, Shannon, uh, yes. sorry, Javier. Yes. Shantana. Where are we going to next? All right, we have another story from an anonymous submission. And the, the title of the story is, there's a reason zeros look like tiny little screams. Nice. This is a scary story. This one makes yeah. me, this is like Jen's level story. It makes me really anxious. I was managing a small team of media buyers. As every, every media buyer can relate, overspends happen, big, small, in between, it's gonna happen one way or another. The team I worked with was managing the agency's largest client. One day, one of my direct reports, who was straight out of college, asked if we could step into a conference room to chat. I didn't think much of it. She was really green, so I assumed that she just wanted advice or had a laundry list of questions that she needed to cover. Oh, no. Instead of setting daily budgets for the Raleigh market at $44 a day, she had set them, get ready, for $44 hundred dollars a day yeah everyone's fake uh, in a matter of a week we had spent the entire annual budget for that region this person said they went completely numb they weren't even mad they were just like dead inside <laughs> i knew that i had to take this to my boss and the ceo of the company i thought for sure i was going to get fired after sitting there for a few moments i pulled my boss and the ceo aside to tell them what had happened <laughs> Similar to my reaction, neither of them showed emotion. The CEO just put his hands up and just walked away. That's probably the worst response ever, right? Similar to my reaction, neither of them, it just nothing. So with my heart racing, I went back inside, grabbed my laptop and a LaCroix, nice product placement there, and hid in a corner until I could, could stop shaking. Shortly after, I returned to my desk, and my coworker was so ashamed. She was just hovering over in a corner. I told her that it was going to be okay, and if anything, it was my name on the line. We would learn from this moment. So the resolution here is, as with most overspends, we were able to absorb some of the hit on a make good and adjust other budgets to ensure that there was ample coverage in the area. And as for the lesson here, with this team, we had pacing meetings, morning, noon, and night. And I think that's the real big takeaway here is the learning was like, stay in touch, stay pacing. 
But if you own your own mistakes, it generally turns out okay. And as long as you learn from them, everything comes out all right. And then this person added a little PS at the end. And it said, if you're my boss or CEO of this company and you're listening, thank you for not firing me. It's a good story. I can't, my heart just, oh, when I hear yeah. that, like, can you imagine 44 to 440? The, the 4, annual budget. Rather. Yeah. yeah, that's the annual that's budget. Right. They In a week. It. Yeah. <laughs> oh. I, I've never had one that bad. No, that's I, have, bad. I have had a, a good media mishap when I was working on a campaign for baby Einstein's 20th anniversary. You know, we weren't, I, I was never a media maven. I always had agencies for that, but I didn't have the budget to have like a real true planning agency. So I just had a buying agency and we did all the creative ourselves in house and it was good creative, but after two weeks, it wasn't performing. And I realized we had no backup creative. So I had to pause the whole campaign for two weeks while I scrambled to go get new creative. And that was my big takeaway was like, always have a backup plan and make sure you have backup creative. So that's kind of my Smart. version of a media story, horror right. story as well. I'll add a giggle for a media story. It wasn't at one of my telcos, it was another company, but we had a junior buyer who was really gung ho and kind of knew everything and you couldn't tell her anything. So she placed a pretty heavy buy for us and ended up um, not blocking X-rated sites. So our brand was popping in some really, really um, uncomfortable. Creepy uh, places. Creepy places, but the best is when you get called into your boss's <laughs> office and they want to show you where it is. I'm like, I'm good. I'll take your word for it. Like, I want to see that. I'm yeah. sure we, nope, we had to have the screenshots of exactly where I had to, um, address that with the, the buyer. So, so no pictures or pictures or it didn't happen. Yeah. We were good on that. Ooh, I believe yeah. that it did. I don't no need pictures. those. I don't need those. I was going to claw. For sure. Absolutely. Yeah. Awesome. Awesome. Uh, I love that story. Well, I hate that story, but I, I'm <laughs> glad they, I'm glad they submitted it. Um, let's, let's bring on Mr. Jeremy Hazelwood now, founder of Ampla Marketing and someone who probably would play the character that actually <laughs> outsmarts the monster in a horror flick. Cause the guy is brilliant. You're, uh, I mean, you're all, you're all <laughs> suited up here. I love the, I love the tuxedo. It looks great. Uh, yeah, man. Toast. yeah. Awesome. Well, welcome to the show, Jeremy. Tell us a little bit about uh, one of your scary stories. Sure. Thanks for having me on. And hello, other panelists and attendees. Thanks for joining. It's been really awesome listening to the horror stories. And as you all talk, it's reminded me of several more that I didn't share that I probably uh, have been suppressing over the years because it, it triggers uh, cries and weeping. Um, but thank you all for sharing. So my story. It was a day, just like today, and it was a client meeting. And this is not a typical marketing story, but more an agency organizational story. But I worked for an agency that served nonprofits and uh, did direct mail as well as digital. And like many agencies, you have kind of a direct mail side and you have a digital side. And my role was to oversee the digital for this client. And so the scary part, well, not even the scary part, but it's terrifying is there were 20 people in one meeting, which is like, there should never be 20 people in a meeting ever, ever. And, unless and you're that's celebrating, never a good idea. Right? Unless you're, yeah, unless you're celebrating. Yeah. But why are there 20 people in a meeting? But that's not the horror story. It sounds like it, but no. So we begin to go over the digital results. And everything's going good. And then all of a sudden, like, rah, 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 the client turned into like <laughs> Mr. Hyde on me and was like, Jeremy, you told us that the creative and digital was going to match creative and direct mail. Chick-fil-A, they use cows everywhere. Billboards, direct mail, TV. People see the cow. It's the thing that weaves everything together. It's integrated. You told me. It was going to be integrated. Why is it not integrated? Where are our cows? 
you know, what are we doing to bring this message together for nonprofits? And so meanwhile, I'm, I'm the digital guy. I'm not like the creative in the room. And I'm looking around at my team, which out of 20 people, there were creatives there and there were um, senior level executives for our, our agency there. And everyone's just watching me just get ginsued and hacked. And like, I'm sitting here getting shot up and everybody's like, like nobody on my team is making eye contact with me and they left me out to rot and the client just gave it to me. I was a corpse, a corpse. And so what happened is um, the meeting was over and um, after the meeting, after the meeting, there's like, wait, what happened? I lost my camera. Sorry. I'm, I, I was, was like, expecting you to come off? back with some costume no, change. I, I think you were coming back <laughs> with on, like man. a Blow. bloody mask. Yeah. You know yeah. I was watching the screen. I was like, who dropped off? Because I saw like less boxes, but I was so animated. Like I clicked my mouse and it, it ended my video. But I, but it's like the, the narration. That might we'll be edit you a new effect. costume after yeah. you know, production. Oh, here we go. Here we go. So it's like this. And so off camera, the client was like, Jeremy, he's so this and so that. And, but I'm in the room that, uh, all right, that was dumb. <laughs> either way. Um, but so after the fact, like we had like this post meeting and, um, you know, people are like, Oh, sorry, Jeremy, that, that, that happened. Like people are like, sorry for me, but it's like, what about you? It's like, nobody spoke up for me. Um, even the people that were over like creative, they were just like, man, I'm sorry that happened. But nobody was like, I should have said something like they left me out there. But the, uh, what we learned, because we've all learned from these horror stories, is, you know, the communication piece. So we got together. We're like, this can never happen again. Like, for me, I, and I told them, I was like, look, you guys left me out there. Like, I can't, and I'm not going to, like, throw them under the bus to the client and be like, well, that's right. not my job. That's their job. I just was like, all right, just give it to me. But, you know, so as an organization, we had a meeting like, look, we can't let this happen again um, here let's refine these roles so that we know who is going to be responsible. And it was just a crazy oversight as an agency because direct mail is creating theirs, digital is creating theirs, but there was no person to oversee everything. Um, but it not only helped us with that client, but other clients in the future as well to make sure that there was that point person. And, and it was at a time where it was still relatively new to have like a digital side. The digital yeah. team was relatively new. So they're just trying to figure things out through trial and error. Uh, but it came at the expense of uh, a pretty rough client meeting. And, uh, you know, naturally I felt, you know, kind of pissed off with my, my teammates, but, you know, ultimately it's like there was a greater good that came out of it because we were able to provide better work and have open communication and really those blind spots were revealed to us. So that is my story. Ooh. The end question, question mark, mark, question mark. <laughs> nice. Good one. That was awesome. That was great. Awesome. It's been really well, nice to have such seasoned people come on and tell these stories. I think everybody, you know, watching could probably learn something uh, from each of you. I know I took away a few things of my own. Yeah, absolutely. Communication, planning, resiliency. Teamwork. Uh, Never leave Teamwork, the soldier. Teamwork, right? Field. Change the passwords. Change yeah. passwords. <laughs> yeah. Jen, uh, Jen, real quick. I saw you, uh, you, you, you turned the turtleneck up when Jeremy was telling that story. I know. Is there something, was there something that, that brought back a bad memory? How much time do we have? No, it's the moment of like when you're, when you're left for dead and you know you're about to get reamed. Yeah. And you gotta take it. You're like, fine. Right? Yeah. Bring it. I yeah. Mean, I, I understand because I've been the client, but I've never been a reaming client. Like, accidents mm -hmm. happen. I've never been the one that like, pulled somebody into the woodshed. You know, either do your job or don't, and people make mistakes. But belittling people, and that used to bother me, and I witnessed that in almost every company, how they used to treat agencies, I found mm -hmm. abhorrent. And I literally was like, I, I need them. They're providing a service. They're not. They're not somebody that you just dump on. And it, it would, it bothered me a lot when I w worked in all the corporations I've worked in and not everybody, but it was, it was almost an afterthought. And what I've liked, what I've seen happen in the age of digital and redu reduction of corporate teams is that agencies have a valued seat at the table and I've seen it get better. 
Um, at least, or maybe I'm witnessing better interactions. But I, I just remember when I first started, like just having somebody get reamed, I'm like, what? How, how's that make you feel better? <laughs> like, how's yeah. that solving? And yeah. you think they woke up and like, I'm going to show you today, you know, outside the poop person. <laughs> um, I think that's <laughs> but I, I don't, I don't, that, that, that's cringeworthy to me because nobody, we're all adults. So don't, don't make yourself feel better on the back of somebody else. And that just bothers me when I see that where I yeah. witness that. Yes. Every once in a while, you, you know, you get a little grounding moment and a humbling moment, but going for somebody's throat and everyone else running because it's not their turn tells me there's a culture issue. Ooh, yeah, exactly. you were you yep, were yep. actually yeah. saying what I was thinking is yeah. I worked inside of a couple of organizations where that was the culture. Um, okay. You know, not only to beat each other up inside of the company, but then really go at the vendors that way. Mm. Um, you know, and I think that, I mean, any, look, you know, I've been on both sides of it. Um, when I've been on the company side, the client side, I've tried to be a really good client and not be that bad, you know, reaming client, right? right. When I've been on the agency side, I think sometimes uh, you just, you know, maybe sometimes as the more like seasoned or mature, or longer in your career person on the team, you get to that place where, you know, sometimes somebody's got to fall on the sword. And you yeah. just kind of take on that role. Like you're going to be, you know, William Wallace and you're just going to run in there, paint yourself blue and go. Uh -huh. And, you know, maybe you come out alive, maybe you don't. But I think, I think that's, you know, it's part of the game a little bit too, right? Yeah, yeah okay. absolutely. And hey, real quick. people. <laughs> yeah, got to take, got to take care. We're, we're all in it together for sure. Yeah. That's right. Um, yeah. Listen, we actually have a, uh, a question from the audience. Oh. Um, so I'm going to go ahead and read this one off and, and open this up to it, everybody it here. Start with how any, how are any of you employed? I'm just kidding. Um, <laughs> yes, 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 it is that one. Um, <laughs> do we have any stories where major deadlines were completely missed? due to either internal or external issues and then somebody ended up losing their job on either side that's uh that's horrific for sure um i'm trying to think but i'm like jeremy i suppress a lot <laughs> <laughs> we should have done shots after each story and that'd be like liquid yeah. chart right now right yeah. everything um, and even like the office supplies that we stole. I'm just kidding. Not, not <laughs> for others. I've heard about. <laughs> it's my staple. Any, anybody, uh, anybody miss deadlines and seeing jobs lost? I've seen agencies removed. I haven't. I've seen an agency removed because of a deadline for a shoot that we did. They were supposed to bring in for a product. We, it was a competitive, um, a competitor was beating um, our company, I won't say which one, pretty badly. We had an emergency, like, you know, everything's on fire, like we're curing cancer and bringing the kidneys from the helicopter. But anyway, everyone was working and hair on fire. We pulled everything together. We set unrealistic, in my opinion, unrealistic deadlines and expectations. Mm -hmm. And unfortunately, the agency, I think either out of fear or culture was afraid to push back. They signed up for it. They didn't have 3D sharks that they could fake it <laughs> and <laughs> build their own. And they went and they spent a lot of money and we did not make the deadline for the campaign and they were not renewed. And it was probably a good 12 to $15 million retainer with them. And I, I think it was one of, obviously that wasn't the only catalyst. It was like you're off with their heads, but I don't think anyone stood up enough to say this is unrealistic. I don't know if that the end result would have been the same, but I do know that it was, um, when I heard what they were asking for, I'm like, I hope someone's telling them like the laws of physics still apply. Right. Like, you know, mm. and they didn't. And I think to that point, Javier Shantana, that they fell on the sword. And unfortunately it wasn't merely a flesh wound. It was uh, yeah. a lot more permanent. So it was unfortunate. Um, but I think that was the, the campaign that broke the camel's back, if you will. So yeah yeah i i think to um to answer the person's question kind of directly i haven't seen that exact one-to-one -one. i think like you said it's 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 a culmination of other things yeah. um i have seen uh people lose their jobs based on um uh, having uh, uh over a very major rebrand um 
leak out some of what the new brand was going to become yeah. and that that obviously precipitated a, a, a quick exit. Um, mm -hmm. But I think the I think the thing with the missing a deadline, hopefully you are communicating one of the other one of the other uh, takeaways we had earlier, hopefully you're communicating um, a lot with your client from an agency standpoint and making sure those expectations are set that if deadlines mm -hmm. look like they're going to be missed, you've already put some things in place. So I think there's a yeah. lot of, a lot of uh, lessons that we've already learned and talked about here mm -hmm. that actually would uh, negate that, uh, that question. So mm -hmm. any other thoughts? We're gonna close up here in a little bit. Any, any exit thoughts? I, I love that um, we've all had stories that we've gone through and we've survived. It's good to see yeah. everyone. Misery loves company or success. However <laughs> you know. yeah. I like success. Yeah. Well, listen, I, I, I want to, oh man. Yeah, this is, this, this has been a lot of fun. I really have to uh, uh, thank you, Jen, Nicole, Dean, Jeremy. Thank you so much for our guest who I know wanted to show up, um, Jennifer Rogers Givens. Uh, we had Vicki Wilkins lined up and we also had Alan McGee. Unfortunately, I think the storms uh, that we've had okay. the other night really caused a, 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 a headache and I wish all of them the best. Um, mm -hmm. Hopefully everybody's gonna get back to um, something a little more fun this weekend and not having to repair fences and yeah. things like that. Um, it's yeah, pretty, pretty bad. So anyway, yeah. thank you all. Um, I'm going to read off real quick. If you want to stick around, stick around. If you want to drop, it's okay to drop. But um, I do want to thank everybody for joining us this week. Um, it actually went surprisingly well considering, uh, you know, this. Uh. But uh, <laughs> Listen, join us again next week. We're going to have uh, Zoe Glade, uh, VP of Marketing over at Spoonful One. If people don't know who Zoe is, um, you're going you're gonna to love her. I know uh, Javier Shantana loves some Zoe. So, uh, I do. I do. Is... Maybe she'll tell the scary story about the time she almost had to fire me as our agency partner. We'll see. see. <laughs> yeah, that would be, I, I, I say bring it for sure. I said almost. Almost. Yeah. yeah. No, she's... she's uh, absolute gem in the community and um, she is a true marketing technology leader she's worked on uh, content strategy paid media brand strategy e-commerce uh, digital social home depot Spanx coca-cola all the way down like it, 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 sh it she is very 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 impressive and she's just so damn cool um, at Spoonful One, as VP of Marketing, uh, she continues to leverage that power of technology and storytelling. And Spoonful One's got an amazing story. They have some groundbreaking products that are um, about early allergen introduction. So if you think about uh, children who have peanut allergies, gluten allergies, things like that, they have uh, science behind this. Um, that actually can help um, help kind of detour those things. And I'm going to let her talk about it because I just butchered it. Um, but she's going to join us next week. Um, I do want to thank again, everybody. I want everybody to have a safe weekend. Please get out and vote on Tuesday. And uh, we will see you all next Friday. Hi. There it is. I like it. Cool. Everybody have a, have a good Halloween. Halloween. Bye,